inside the project so that we can exchange knowledge among us. But as we are trying to build an European research community dedicated to the problem of forest, forest fires, we want also to share this knowledge so that we can exchange people. with people from uh, not only from the project. So that's why we opened this uh, seminar to uh, everybody. I hope this will be useful. And uh, we are, of course, selecting topics that are at the cut edge of research. And uh, we, uh, let's say all of us, we want to learn from uh, these specialists. Uh, the fire risk project, as you, um, many of you know, it's a very large and ambitious project that has, um, let's say, aiming um, to different aspects of fire research and fire management. And we want to look uh, at the prevention, mitigation, and recovery of uh, the risk of fire. And uh, for, to this, we are going to assess the fire to, in order to redu reduce it and to adapt for the future conditions. And uh, in these future conditions, we have uh, different aspects. One of them is of, is, of course, climate. We have uh, also to look at what will be the future ecology of the environment. And that's why we are addressing these two topics today. Uh, the project is uh, served by 38 partners that come from all over Europe and also uh, from other countries. You can see here in this map the location of our partners. And uh, we are uh, organizing uh, different activities like this one. Um, we are, um, in December, we are going to organize a webinar on the fires that occurred in, uh, this summer, in 2021. Uh, this will be dedicated, let's say, to an overall view of the fire situation and the study of some particular large fires that we are uh, performing now. Uh, you can, of course, get more information on the web page of the project at this address, but I would like to uh, show you um, wildfires uh, are increasingly an animation the that you societies. They can lead to ecological and economic damage and loss of lives. Due to climate and land use changes, their extent and severity are increasing, posing great challenges in Europe and worldwide. The risk of a wildfire occurring depends on weather and fuel availability. Human drivers like accidents and arson, but also on socio-economic aspects, such as land use and fire management strategies. To enable effective wildfire management, an integrated approach is necessary. Before a fire, improving fire risk assessment facilitates reducing negative fire impacts. Fire suppression must be carried out considering its full environmental and societal effect. Recovery actions should produce more fire-resilient landscapes and communities. The European project Fire You Risk addresses these needs by fully integrating physical, socio-economic and political contexts into existing protocols. Its aim is to deliver a coordinated and science-based strategy for European wildfire management. It brings together 38 partners from all fire-related sectors, from researchers, the first responders and authorities. Supported by citizen scientists, they provide the knowledge necessary to co-design effective solutions. To assess wildfire risk, it will use innovative methods for estimating and communicating fire danger and vulnerability. These include satellite and airborne sensors, geospatial analysis, meteorological and socio-economic modeling. To reduce fire risk, land management strategies will be evaluated to better manage fuel and a new, near real-time tool for predicting fire behavior will be produced for decision makers, from first responders to evacuation planners. To enable adapting to future risk, high-resolution climate scenarios will be complemented by demographic and socioeconomic projections, as well as environmental policies. The resulting strategies will be implemented as pilot sites and demonstration areas across Europe, and all findings showcased via open access, providing valuable knowledge and tools for every stakeholder. With their work, Fire you Risk partners aim to improve current wildfire approaches by providing updated fire science and management strategies towards a more resilient future for Europe and elsewhere. Okay, <laughs> this uh, animation, it's a very recent product from our dissemination activities, and uh, uh, it gives you, let's say, a very quick picture of the project. Now I will introduce um, uh, each one of the speakers. The first one is Kirsten Tonike. 
she uh, received her PhD from uh, uh, geology at Potsdam and then worked at the Max Planck Institute in Vienna in Germany. In 2005, she received a Marie Curie Fellowship to the University of Brussels in Great Britain, where she coupled mechanistic fire, global fire models into climate vegetation models at the School of Geography. Kirsten joined the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research PIC in 2007, where she is since then, and she is now Deputy Head of Research Department on Earth System Analysis and Working Group Leader on Ecosystem Intransitions. Research focuses on how climate and land use changes transform ecosystems, fire and biodiversity. For many years, she has been working in the process fire modeling, and she's one of the core developers developers of the Spitfire fire model, which is very well known and has been impl implemented in, the, in several fire enabled models. Her team develops and applies this model to state-of-the-art climate scenarios to investigate climate impacts on fire and vegetation worldwide and coupled to the Potsdam Earth model. Uh, she was involved in previous EU research projects related to fire, and she greatly appreciates learning about new perspectives in fire research. Uh, Kirsten is leading a work package in a fire risk project that deals exactly with this topic of adaptation to future scenarios. Uh, if you allow me, uh, I will immediately also present Thomas Hitler, who will be the second speaker. Uh, they'll speak uh, one after the other, but I'll uh, present them both now. Thomas Hitler obtained his PhD in Job Biosphere Science in Lund, Sweden. Uh, since 2010, he is a professor of the Fran in Frankfurt uh, Senckenberg in, uh, Biodiversity and Climate Research Center uh, in the, uh, Germany. His main research interest is to understand the distribution of life on Earth, species, biodiversity, vegetation types, ecosystems, through space and time. He's particularly interested in interactions between climate and terrestrial biosphere. This includes potential impacts of climate change, species, ecosystems, and associated ecosystem services, as well as the whole of the biosphere in the Earth climate system, for example, the carbon and water cycling. Uh, methodologically, vegetation and ecosystem modeling in combination to field data ranging from fossil plants to satellite-based Earth observation local to global scales has been the core of his work. Um, Thomas, Besides research, he's also very active in science policy interface, notably as lead author of the Intergovernmental Science uh, Platform on the Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. This is also a very important uh, asset of the project Fire Risk because we are also addressing or trying to address uh, policies, not only at national levels, but also at European levels. I thank you again, both of you, and immediately I give the floor to Kirsten, so please, can you? Uh, let me just give a, a couple of announcements, please. For all the participants, this session is being broadcasted on YouTube, so the questions from YouTube can be posed on the chat and uh, we will transmit them here. All the questions that you have, you can put them on that question and answers button on the bottom of, of your screen. You have the Q&A button, uh, and we will pass them on to the speakers. We will now disable the chat so that we can avoid any confusion during the, the speak. So leave your questions for the question and answers buttons, but please don't use it to, to chat around, okay? So please, Kirsten. Thank you very much, Luis Mario. So Kirsten, please. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity um, to um, yeah, speak here in this webinar and to explain to you a wide uh, and, and yeah, very rich um, topic, which has been a subject of uh, research and model development since the late 1990s. And uh, Thomas and myself, we are just uh, two people uh, working in this field of research, uh, developing these dynamic global vegetation models, and now a subtype of them, the so-called fire-enabled ones. So what I will try to do is to give you a bit of a context um, of where we are acting. So it's global, so we focus on changes in the terrestrial biosphere. 
and um, how we um, address uh, the interaction between vegetation and fire at this rather general scale. To give you a bit of a context, one example how one could explain is the importance of the terrestrial biosphere for the uh, global carbon cycle. So here is a slide uh, with the inventory of uh, anthropogenic um, carbon emissions and how um, they have influenced the different flux um, storages. Um, so this slide is from the Global Carbon Project. It has been um, assembled uh, from 2009 and 2018, so it's an average. So human um, society has em emitted um, 34.7 gigatons of CO2 per year from fossil fuel emissions and all uh, industrial emissions and also deforestation and land use change have emitted 5.5 gigatons of CO2 per year in that time. So the majority, 86%, is coming from these industrial emissions and 14% is uh, coming from the land use change. So what you see from the picture also is that in many areas, specifically for a long time in the tropics, fire is used in the deforestation process. So that's one of the big global fluxes. Lucky enough, we have a functioning, still a functioning terrestrial biosphere that takes up 29% um, of this emitted CO2. And we have the ocean uh, taking up uh, physically and biologically 23% of these emitted, still leaving 44% in the atmosphere. And um, if you quickly count, those numbers don't add up. So due to some uncertainties, um, we have, um, let me have a laser pointer, we have a, a budget imbalance. Um, so this is just to make sure that, of course, uh, these uncertainties um, are well documented. Um, so we need a functioning um, biosphere, and this biosphere is, of course, very dynamic. We know that fire is an important ecological factor in many ecosystems, but we also know that uh, we as human society have been overusing this and stretching it to a component where to an extent where it's actually really damaging it. We need, um, and here's a figure from um, the current IPCC report from working group one um, on the um, six assessments report. In short, it's um, AR6. They assembled a very nice figure um, illustrating how under the different future scenarios, um, the proportion of CO2 emissions taken up by land and ocean emissions becomes actually smaller with higher cumulative CO2 emissions. So what these scenarios do is they combine a trajectory of future climate change um, with socioeconomic changes. So how would the economy, land use um, and um, other human activities change and lead to emissions and how the earth system, um, if we just uh, define it with the atmosphere, land and ocean would actually react to it. So if we meet um, the two degree targets under um, as agreed with the Paris Climate Accord, um, so we have these low climate change path uh, and low land use path um, here, named under SSP 1, 1.9 or 2.6. So these are the scenarios where these targets can be managed or even kept well below, which is an important part um, for the um, uh, important criteria to actually try to reach only to limit, sorry, to limit climate warming to 1.5 degree. Um, so under the, if we meet those um, uh, targets, uh, land and ocean would actually be able to capture 70% um, of the emitted CO2. It goes down um, if we only manage to limit global warming um, to two degrees, it will be limited to 65%. But if we do not manage and have more intense uh, socioeconomic changes, it goes down to 54. If we, um, yeah, the more severe, it gets uh, the more reduced it is, it is and under the um, 
yeah, very grim scenarios and high climate change, uh, which would could lead to um, CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere way beyond um, 1,000 uh, ppm, depending on the on the climate model. The capacity um, of land and ocean to uh, store this carbon um, sinks to 38 percent. Even though, if you look here at the bars, um, these um, the amount that can be absorbed um, is still increasing, but the larger proportion you see here in those gray bars is what remains in the atmosphere. So it is, a, again, a call um, for uh, limiting global warming to two degrees and well below, because this is actually um, what would still be challenging for us as human society and for nature. Um, another attempt to, to capture this is what would be uh, underlying. Of course, there would be um, e so still severe ecosystem changes happening uh, with this between one and two degrees um, of global warming. Here, this is a, a study that was published in 2013, uh, where um, they grouped the scenario outcome according to the um, increase in global mean temperatures and, the, uh, and mapped the natural um, vegetation threatened by severe change. So that was changes in vegetation composition and also in the ability to store uh, carbon in its uh, living and dead biomass. And so the, here you see also a, a linear, a nonlinear increase, a real uh, jump if you go beyond two degrees. So all this evidence um, contributed to the scientific knowledge of why we have to keep global warming below two degrees. One tool um, to um, investigate or was used here. It's uh, in this publication, it's called um, Ecosystem Models, but uh, from maybe some of you are familiar with those acronyms. Um, these are the, uh, in origin um, dynamic global vegetation models that are partly also uh, coupled to climate or earth system models. And um, so here, um, they, uh, many, many processes from terrestrial um, ecosystems are captured. So what we did is um, with these models, um, there was a uniform uh, protocol used to drive these models um, with a number of climate change scenarios. And then the outcome um, to map um, the severe ecosystem change um, was then used to produce this figure. So later, um, investigations in the, fourth, in the fifth assessment report and also the IPCC um, special report one on 1.5 degree target um, updated um, five reasons of concern. And um, how to explain you quickly how to read this figure. Of course, we have um, high risk, uh, very high risk in, in this deep purple one, um, high risk in the in the reddish colors, moderate and undetectable risk, um, moderate in yellowish colors and undetectable when it's white. So again, um, the warming is uh, grouped according to the uh, global mean surface temperature change. And here you have in this figure mapped the uh, gray range, um, how the temperature has uh, evolved between 2006 and 2015. And um, here already there are some concerns with current conditions. Uh, reason of concern is extreme weather events. And here the IPCC includes also um, events such as extreme fires and maps a moderate to high risk um, for current conditions, but also in the future. Of course, the distribution of impact is also a reason of concern or the reason of concern for large uh, singular events. And we have learned that uh, this is all also um, something that is increasingly threatening our society. So um, we have spoken about these dynamic global vegetation models. Actually, their um, history goes back uh, to the 1990s when actually a group of models that had worked in the 1990s on so-called biomodels, 
So using bioclimatic information where the, uh, the distribution, the climate envelope um, for broad biomes like uh, the boreal forest or the tropical forest could occur. Um, thought that actually we need to combine this uh, with the knowledge on vegetation dynamics, um, but also consider plant physiology to inform biogeochemistry. So how would the global carbon cycle change? And also, of course, uh, include the biophysics. Um, and the idea was to bring this together. And so the, the new type of models, the dynamic global vegetation models, um, were actually um, invented. And since then, they have been uh, a model of success um, because many developing groups um, are continuously working and further developing is So one could really state that they have evolved into ecosystem models. What they were designed to do is to project impacts of climate change on potential natural vegetation. So that is the natural vegetation that can uh, grow in a certain place under climate and soil conditions. Um, and so it captures uh, physical, um, uh, physiological processes from seasonal to decadal timescales. And uh, not to forget, uh, many models now include uh, the dynamics of crops and managed grasslands. So we can now uh, also include the effect of land use change um, on the terrestrial carbon cycle and also on the vegetation dynamics. What does it mean for uh, the cycles of nutrients, um, carbon um, and water? So here's a typical scheme. So what we do is um, we force our models with climate information, um, radiation. We need this for uh, simulating the photosynthesis, CO2 concentration, and if the model has the nitrogen cycle incorporated, of course, nitrogen deposition and soil physical properties. And then uh, in intermediate processes uh, from at the time scales of from days to weeks, we simulate the vegetation phenology allocation um, of the um, yeah, um, new carbon that has been assimilated by photosynthesis um, how the plant is actually using it to grow. And also at this time scale, soil carbon and nitrogen dynamics are calculated. Then what you could call the, the ecosystem state. Of course, uh, some plants have a better uh, growth condition than others. From that you have uh, uh, results, the vegetation composition and structure. Um, and we can, uh, the dead, uh, wood is, of course, entering the, the litter layer, and from that the soil carbon pool or the nitrogen carbon pool is filled up. Plants, uh, of course, take up water through the, uh, transpiration, so they need the soil water pool um, as a source for water, transpiration, and then uh, this is feeded back into the atmosphere. Um, the fast processes, of course, um, are linked here with the canopy exchange and vegetation physiology. So behind that is what I just said about the transpiration and, uh, and um, the photosynthesis. And also, um, of course, uh, we simulate the soil heat and moisture dynamics um, at this scale. And from this, um, the competition um, sort of um, determines what we call vegetation dynamics. So how fast um, the plants can grow um, determines their, their composition, but also the mortality and their risk uh, to die from disturbance. Mostly um, DGVMs um, as a disturbance agent um, consider fire. So many, um, if not all uh, DGVMs nowadays have, have some sort of representation of fire embedded. Why is that a very good thing? Because you can actually study the feedback between these uh, fire disturbance to the um, vegetation dynamics and of course the, how it influences vegetation composition and structure and the cycling of carbon uh, nutrients and water. However, uh, the typical vegetation structure in these DGVMs is um, still very um, simple. 
it has some historic reason. Um, and you need to know that we divide the terrestrial biosphere, so the global scale, think of a global map, um, into about 60,000 grid cells. And for each of these grid cells, over a time from uh, days to centuries, these processes are calculated. So in the first place, um, we think of the computer capacities in the late 1990s and the early 2000s. Uh, some compromise had to be done. And so um, a first compromise was done on the typical vegetation structure, namely that an average individual, one example you see here, um, how a tree looks like um, in the PUFT uh, population, uh, how it uh, is structured by the crown area, the, uh, the tree height, it is divided in uh, sapwood and hardwood, and of course it has uh, fine roots in um, the proportion divided in, um, for example, two soil layers. And this is competing with a simplified grass individual that has just leaves. Um, and of course the leaf area index and some fine roots. So each average individual is the representative of one so-called plant functional type. Um, and so the grid cell uh, can be covered by several such plant functional type. So one example can be, for example, um, a temperate broadleafed evergreen tree. That would be um, an example to describe um, the Mediterranean uh, broadleaf vegetation. And uh, another one can be um, a needle, temperate needle leaf tree, um, also evergreen. So with you see with these qualitative attributes, we describe the biome where it occurs and the phenology it has. And of course you could expand this name uh, with naming it um, a shade or light tolerant or a fire tolerant or intolerant PFT. And so they cover a certain area and they compete. Um, so the most productive, and if we think of fire, the best fire adapted PFT, if it is in the fire prone area, uh, can increase its fractional cover. So the proportion it covers in, uh, in a grid cell. And so through this mechanism, the uh, PFTs that can establish due to the climate conditions, compete here and grow and um, yeah, assemble um, yeah, this, this area and, and store its carbon in, in biomass in the litter layer and also in the soil carbon. One example, sorry, one example uh, for this is the LPJ ML model, one that we are using in the fire EU risk project. Another example also, um, be, uh, I'm glad that this is also part of the uh, Fire EU project. Is um, the LPJ gas model? They have uh, taken a step further and improved the vegetation structure in a so called cohort mode. You would still have, you see the same picture, you would still have this uh, structure of how we would um, yeah, simplify the, the architecture of tree and grass. But now we have several in one grid cell, we have several patches that are replicated. So these are islands of forest where these individual grow uh, uh, over time and their size and distribution um, is capped from one year to another. So these three individuals continue to grow and they have also the physiology, the structure and also the same competi uh, competition for light and, and water and nutrients. So what you can see is then rather a real, a more realistic um, dynamic if how, how a natural uh, forests would look like. And uh, yeah, and so we have these uh, vegetation uh, simulations running in the background. When we now come to think about what we call uh, so-called uh, fire-enabled DGVMs, and uh, yeah, so these DGVMs uh, provide the information on, say, the, the PFT composition, and we can parameterize certain traits like bulk density, how reproductive it is, and uh, how resistant it is to the fire, uh, information on the strength uh, structure, and the size class of the fuel um, subdividing, the litter, 
uh, into different uh, fuel classes. And of course, the moisture is also derived from the soil because we have the soil water bucket model. And um, so the fire model, um, if it's, for example, process based, um, can subdivide um, ignition, spread and effects. And depending on how the models are designed, it, of course, for the ignition, it takes into account um, the weather and fuel characteristics um, from which the fire danger can be derived. Human activities like uh, specifying the human caused ignitions, topography uh, can be important, but is ignored uh, until now in these uh, fire models and, uh, and lightning is prescribed. Spread. Uh, we can, because we have the climate information, we can read in uh, wind information as well to calculate the fire spread. Um, of course, the, here the PFT parameters influencing uh, the uh, fire spread, specifically the fuel bike density uh, is used and the fuel characteristics are quantified so we can calculate the fire spread. And um, that has the effects on how much dead fuel is consumed from it results the fire intensity, um, the uh, flame height, of course, then depending on the vegetation composition um, and the sensitivity to fire, the plant mortality results. And so that determines the fuel consumption after the fire year. Um, and so uh, these effects then feed back to the vegetation and we have not only the, the option to calculate the carbon or trace gas emissions, um, but also see, okay, after the fire year, how the PFT composition has changed, the, the stand structure and the carbon pools and, and fuel classes and how the vegetation dynamics is um, affected from it. This component then, of course, uh, defines the condition um, for the um, the next fire year, so how the vegetation has changed. So we have a continuous feedback between um, vegetation and fire driven by climate emissions. And if you now think about um, this fire enabled DGVM being coupled uh, to a climate or earth system model, then these carbon emissions together with the changes in the strand structure could also go back and influence the, the climate. So if we talk about fire enabled DGVMs, we have the feedback between vegetation and fire um, and can compute the carbon emissions, but the feedback to the climate is not possible. Okay, so one option, uh, one example is the, is the Spitfire model um, that I co-developed and uh, we um, use um, the Nestrov index to quantify um, the fire risk. Um, it's a very simple one, um, we know, but it is one that needs, um, that only calculates the climatic fire risk and it needs only temperature and precipitation as an input. Um, from that, uh, we can calculate the fuel moisture um, and the probability that a fire would spread and com combining um, these two equations, we have here our equation for uh, calculating the fire danger index that takes into account the moisture of extinction, um, the fuel amount and the fuel composition and this Nestrov index. Um, the number of ignitions um, currently are only um, a function of human population density. Um, and the lightning cost ignitions are derived from satellite data and prescribed. Um, fire spread uh, should sound very familiar to you. We calculate um, the spread of an average surface fire um, and use the um, behave model um, to calculate the rate of spread, which then gives us, if we assume an elliptical shape, um, the mean fire area and the area burned then results from the ignitions, the fire danger, the mean fire area, and the fire of uh, the area of the grid cell gives us in a daily time step um, the area burned. And we run this uh, throughout the years and over um, the decades. So we can uh, assemble um, the information and aggregate it to the area burned in a particular grid cell, but also aggregate it to the globe. Here's a complete description, um, a flowchart of all the interactions. You can study it uh, more in detail 
uh, if you look at the publication. So these, uh, I said, uh, the, the Spitfire model was implemented in a number of other um, DGVMs, for example, uh, JS Bach, um, LPEJ Guess, I have talked about it before, but also in Orchidae. And we are also glad that we have the Orchidae team in our work package. So we call them the fire enabled um, DGVMs. And here's an example from the fire MIP, the fire model intercomparison project, where they brought together uh, those models and, and uh, a number of other ones um, and classified them if they have a dynamic biogeography. So wood vegetation dynamics, the change in the PFT coverage change um, with uh, climate and fire interactions. And here they described uh, the fire model type and if they consider um, human suppression on fire spread. So um, you, the Spitfire model, for example, um, has only human ignitions um, presented, but of course humans uh, fight fire. And this is a function that is not yet considered um, in, in Spitfire. But others, uh, other implementations like the JS Bach, um, they have developed a function. So we see a number of uh, further developments happening here. So one output, one example, um, what um, the people did in this um, impressive fire MIP analysis is to check the model quality under current climate. And for example, here we see the change in burnt area um, at the global scale from 2002 to 2012. And the gray range is the compilation of uh, remote sensing data. And of course, uh, a good model quality would be that the interannual variability is captured and the trend um, as well. So you see here a number of spaghetti curves um, where some models sort of get this, um, and, and, but mostly they are struggling um, with the trend. And this has uh, one, of course, to do with the um, error propagation from the climate um, forcing um, to the vegetation dynamics, um, to the fire model, and also the feedback. So, um, yeah, and, and this is, of course, a challenge because many details and processes have to be captured. Um, what is a good thing about it is that one can start to compare this and nail down um, these uh, processes that need improvement and also assess the model quality um, because these intercomparisons have developed um, a common protocol on how the models should be run, uh, which forcing data should be used, and also um, check the and document um, how the model is uh, configured. So the table that we saw on the slide before. And, um, and so um, this can feed back also into the um, ECMAP, the Intersectional Impact Model Intercomparison Project that not only deals with fire, uh, but with many other sectors as well. So in this uh, scenario process, um, we have these uh, climate uh, projections from uh, climate models uh, combined with the socioeconomic input, land use change, population change, uh, change in the world economy, and these can be drivers used by these um, impact models and they capture uh, different sectors. And um, so Fire MIP is about to join this activity. So if, if um, EasyMIP updates this figure, then Fire should be listed here. And um, of course, this is um, to see, okay, if we have these, uh, the same forcings, um, is there a possibility to look at cross-sectional interactions? Of course, improve the models, quantify the uncertainties, and also intercomparison with the same uh, degree of global warming. How would the different uh, sectors react uh, to these changes? Um, so far, the, uh, for the fire community, um, there has been attempt to um, a great analysis um, of the fire models. Um, and we have observed a global decline in burnt area and related uh, carbon emissions. It's a slight decline. It's a compensating effect from regions seeing increased uh, fires, um, especially the extreme fire events. 
and also um, the um, trends that land use change reduces when it's replaced with a permanent agriculture. And if this is happening in savanna areas um, like in Brazil or in Africa or other areas, um, of course, you reduce the potential area where fire could freely spread. Um, and so this uh, can uh, compensate uh, the global trend where you see other regions where fires are actually increasing. So in an earlier um, um, assessment report that goes back to the climate model in comparison phase five, so it's called CMIP5 that went into the fifth assessment report of the IPCC, um, the Earth system models uh, did a projection. So um, where they saw a wide range um, of bio, uh, biomass in burning uh, to increase. Um, and so, of course, these emissions increased uh, with higher um, climate warming scenarios. So also delimiting or reducing the, the capacity of the terrestrial vegetation to maintain um, its carbon pools store CO2 in the bi living biomass and build up carbon also in the soil. So you one has to keep in mind that when you um, lose your biomass and your litter on the forest floor through a fire, it is emitted to the atmosphere so that there's less carbon in the first place on the ground that can enter um, the soil carbon pool and be stored there. Of course, it depends on how the vegetation is actually regrowing, if it's regrowing quickly um, and, and is very productive and perhaps also very diverse, um, then this carbon is taken up again. So it's a question of how frequent these extreme events um, at this scale return and interfere with the regrowth of the vegetation. And of course, with uh, increasing uh, temperatures and drought conditions, um, there's clear evidence that there's widespread increase in fire weather uh, throughout the world. So the climatic burning window, as we would say in, in our uh, global fire models, is actually expanding and increasing and getting more severe. And this is also what we observe already with the extreme um, events that we have seen um, threatening certain areas starting from California, Alaska, Siberia, southeastern Australia, and also Brazil. Not to forget the Mediterranean and also uh, regions like Central Europe and Sweden in these years um, have seen uh, relative to what they know as a normal fire regime, um, extreme conditions that have, um, yeah, consumed um, forests and um, yeah, caused um, unhealthy climate um, atmosphere conditions because of the smoke pollution. So what are we trying to do? Um, what are our goals um, in the Fire EURES project is that we want to, of course, improve our simulations and our model quality to be able to improve our projections of future fire regimes in Europe under climate and land use change, um, and also um, how this affects the future fire risk and uh, mapping and analyzing the conditions that could lead to new fire prone areas or increase um, the severe conditions for areas that already are already um, under severe um, or face repeated fire events like in the Mediterranean area. And from that, we have the task uh, to also map future vulnerability um, to be able to identify pathways where we can actually adapt to um, our fire regimes under changing climate and changing vegetation. But before that, there's quite a number of steps that we uh, need to take. And uh, this is our task in the work package. So here's an earlier um, publication where we run LPJ gas, which I introduced you, and LPJ ML with the um, fire models, and we compared them again um, against um, uh, observed burnt area uh, from GFET. So that is satellite-derived uh, burnt area estimates and the European fire statistics. 
And you see that from the um, bars here in the, in the Mediterranean, the LPJML model, for example, was overestimating fire. Um, LPJ gas was uh, a bit closer or say uh, within the range of the Mediterranean. Uh, smaller fire areas uh, were simulated for Western and Eastern Europe, um, but also um, we considered that the um, especially for the LPGML model, the modeling error was quite high. So we did, and with the first generation of uh, these new RCP climate scenarios, uh, we did a future projection on how burnt area would change uh, from uh, current uh, conditions. And so uh, the LPJ gas model um, projected a slight increase under the severe um, climate change for um, yeah, until 2019, and uh, the LPJML saw a much bigger increase um, in these um, in these um, burnt area conditions. So we were not quite happy with the um, with the model quality, and so we started in a different project um, uh, an opportunity to improve um, the model quality by using parameter optimization. Um, so we did this um, for South America because we had a project running there and this um, parameter optimization then helped us to improve the interannual variability um, of the Caatinga and, and uh, Cerrado biome and also the low fire activity in the Amazon. So from this, we actually um, take, oops, sorry, the text box moved up. Um, what we want to do is um, of course, with these parameter optimization, you still have um, the old functions. And of course, it can help you to improve something. But now we want to uh, take one step further and think about hybrid uh, model functions um, where we want to use machine learning techniques so that we say we only not only want to improve the parameters, but actually want to think about uh, rewriting um, those model functions. And we here we think uh, in the first place, of course, on the um, human cause ignitions, but also um, the, the firefighting uh, maybe. So this is something we are currently discussing. And of course, I'm glad that we can uh, collaborate uh, with the Senkenberg and uh, TU Dresden. And of course, there are more partners involved in that. Um, so this is a big, um, activity uh, in our work package. And so we want to uh, apply the improved models then to the new climate scenarios and also land use change scenarios that we will um, get from um, our partners in fire EU risk. And with that, uh, because these land use scenarios will check different European policies, we can then project in the future uh, what will be the effect if we have afforestation strategies under increased fire risk? Um, will that mean that perhaps in areas that become more fire prone, is that actually an increasing in fire risk? And will we lose the carbon that we actually want to fix in regrowing biomass? And uh, what will be the net effect uh, of this policy? Will we create more problems or will this actually be helpful in adapting to future climate change? And also, what are possible adaptation strategies in regions with intensified or accelerated fire regimes? Here, we are happy that we have uh, the feedback um, from the fire experts uh, with many years of, of experience uh, with whom we are uh, very happy to be in, in dialogue. And also, of course, I'm looking forward uh, to the interaction with uh, stakeholders where we can then discuss um, our outcome and, and discuss with them what our results mean and how, what it means in their working context. So to conclude or to provide an, an outlook, we want to build on the experience from these uh, parameter optimization to improve the model functions with high uncertainty or we have not yet considered, uh, or just very broadly, built this um, in hybrid models. So we have a new um, version of our fire-enabled DGBMs with um, lower modeling errors. So we can 
be more confident in using them for future projections of uh, changes in fire under fire, future climate and land use in, uh, change. Provide this information, this data to our partners in fire EU risk. And also because uh, some partners of ours um, are involved in the fire MIP, of course, we will uh, check how we can contribute um, this outcome to the fire MIP so that the um, global change community and can also benefit uh, from these developments. And with that, I thank you for your attention. I think I was slightly over time. I apologize. Um, yeah, but it's a complicated um, and long issue. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Kirsten, uh, for your very excellent talk. You were very clear. And uh, of course, we know that the, this subject is not uh, simple. It's uh, quite complex, but you explained it very nicely. Um, before we proceed to the uh, lecture of Thomas. I'd like to know if there are any questions from the audience. As you know, you may send your questions by written to the question and answers box so that we can take them. Uh, but if uh, we don't have yet anyone, um, I'd like to ask you, um, with these models, one, not, um, one thing that we observe nowadays is that the uh, this climate change during the last years is uh, producing a, a, a change in the vegetation uh, feasibility. Let's say we see in some countries that the plants that existed in uh, certain areas are no longer uh, feasible there, and they are. Um, we have to consider in the future new uh, types of plantations. I would like to ask you if these uh, these models that you described already. Uh, predicted this and what are they uh, planning for the future? Because many people ask, what should be the forest uh, for the next uh, 20, 50 years? Uh, what sh should we do? Um, thank you, Domingos. This is a very um, good question. Um, because of several complications, the model were not, uh, this type of models, they were not able to um, project these, these effects of extreme fires um, or the mega fires um, in, in some areas and also the, the forest changes. For Europe, the problem is that um, we have planted forests with a species that uh, in this dominance would not grow um, in this monoculture, even aged, uh, monospecific stands. And so here we are um, sort of in a, in a specific situation because the DGBMs can simulate the feedback between fire and vegetation, as I try to explain here in my presentation. Um, but they, um, uh, they, they do not simulate um, the, the planted forests uh, in Europe, for example. In areas uh, where this is um, naturally growing forest, one can do that. So one, um uh, thing I would like to achieve, one objective I would like to achieve to improve the model quality that we can actually get better also in projecting these effects on the vegetation changes. Uh, thank you very much, Kirsten. We have now here a question that was uh, raised by uh, Professor Emilio Chuvieco, who is the scientific coordinator of Fire Risk Project. He's asking if the current development of these uh, uh, dynamic global vegetation models uh, with fire, uh, is, if it is suitable to predict extreme events or if they are mainly adapted to general fire occurrence trends. So you partially address this uh, question, I suppose, but if you want to uh, go deeper in, into this, uh, if at present they are designed for general fire occurrence or they can also consider these extreme events because as you know this is what we are aiming in fire risk project is these mm -hmm. very large fires yes um the uh, thanks for the question um so what is what is happening is that um these were designed for for um say medium average uh, changes in fire and vegetation and we, a couple of years ago, we also looked into the capacity of these models to capture extreme fires. 
Um, but at that time, uh, we were also limited by the um, climate data sets um, to actually capture the extreme fire conditions um, in, in, in the right area. So this, uh, but, but I think this has improved because we can now use um, reanalysis data and um, we can also, um, yeah, hope, we also hope to, to improve uh, this capacity of the model to capture these extreme events much, much better. Okay, Kirsten, we have now another question that comes from a Portuguese colleague. And this goes again to the issue of uh, including fire and particularly the firefighting. Um, as you know, there is a, an old question as I would say, if the fire should be uh, extinguished, fought, or, or not. And the um, uh, question is are there any real expectations to include this work to combat fires in the models? Let's say if uh, it can be addressed, the need or the capacity to fight fires in these uh, future models? Um, I think this would be, um, this is the reason why we want to work um, on a con to consider also firefighting that uh, would uh, limit the, the area burn to see um, under, under climate change conditions, um, how it would help to increase the um, biomass or the, the improve the vegetation cover. Um, so yeah, this is something we would we would test as part of testing different management uh, scenarios. If you have these firefighting um, or not, and would it help to to limit it? Um, of course, and I think this will be the focus also of the of the second talk. Uh, if you start to uh, prevent fires um, at the very much scale, you probably um, cannot avoid extreme fires or mega fires from happening. And so the ecological damage might be worse. So what I look forward to is, is especially establishing this dialogue here in the project um, to um, yeah, see the, the pros and cons um, of, of these um, activities and also to see, okay, what, what would it entail uh, in terms of firefighting if uh, one wants to limit um, area burn conditions to a certain level and then discuss uh, with the experts if, if this is actually feasible. Okay, thank you. Well, Kirsten, let's thank you once again. And um, well, we don't have now uh, any further questions direct, directed directly to you. Uh, so we can start with Thomas. But uh, at the end, if of course uh, any question comes to, to uh, regarding your lecture, I would appreciate that you take it. Uh, of so. course, uh, thank you very much. I will be happy to uh, discuss this further and answer further questions at the end. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, so now I invite Thomas Hitler to give his presentation on the. Um, biodiversity and its relation to fires. Yeah, thanks a lot. And thanks a lot for the invitation. It's an honor to give this talk here. We had some problems with the internet connection before inside, so I moved outside, as you might see. <laughs> but now you don't see me because it's so dark. So I have optimized the position very soon, and then I will start. Oh, OK, I'm not going to be much better. But the internet seems to be better. Um, so now I will. Um, start my presentation, which will be about biodiversity and fire. And yeah, Bildschirm freigeben. Let me check. Um, just a second. Here we are. Um, so now you should see my screen. I hope it's not such a big delay as it has been before. It's, it's very much. Okay. Can you? Okay. The screen is okay. Yeah, okay. So, the title of the talk is Biodiversity and Fire a Love Hate Relationship. And I will yeah, talk about the fact that fire for biodiversity is not always bad. And of course, from human perspective, um, we perceive fire normally as a rather bad thing these days. Um, and it's clear that very extreme large fires like the 
the fires in Australia in the 2019-2020 fire season. Here's a picture from Victoria. I mean, they have been devastating for, for human society, for ecosystems, and for biodiversity. But the picture on the left is a type of fire which is not only not harmful for biodiversity, but it's actually necessary to maintain a certain biodiversity and a certain habitat type. And I will soon come back to this. So the, <clears throat> the outline, what I will talk about, um, I will start with a little personal story about um, the, yeah, the love between biodiversity and fire sometimes. Um, when I, for the first time, really thought about this in more detail. Um, then I will talk a little bit about biodiversity trends and drivers in general. Um, and then, yeah, some love-hate global examples about biodiversity and fire. And then I will shift more to Europe. And then I will talk a bit about future scenarios or why we actually are not really there yet to have reliable models that simulate the future of yeah, fire and biodiversity. So now first the personal story. Um, this is a picture from Itasca State Park. It's the old state park in Minnesota where well, I didn't do my PhD there. I did it in Lund, but I modeled um, these forests and other forests in the region. And I also went canoeing there and you know, thought about how these forests function. And I found it quite intriguing to, to read about um, and then also to address in the model um, that the iconic pines in the region, the white pines and the red pines, they basically started disappearing when the park was established or a bit later, in particular since the 1920s. The park was established in 1891, the oldest state park in Minnesota. And what happened when the park was established? Um, well, partly people started preventing fires and the red pines and the white pines start, um, they stopped regenerating. And it, it became clear that without fire being part of the system, one would lose these very, very iconic trees. So now people actually use fire. Um, and I mean, they're still experimenting with different fire regimes, trying to promote um, the, the regeneration of, of the pine trees, which are really forming this, this habitat. And they're also very impressive and beautiful trees. Um, and just to say maybe before the fire was suppressed, um, the, the natural fire, the storms, fire, fire interval was about 40, 40 years for low surface fires and about 150, 200 years for um, ground fires that really destroyed, destroyed large stands. <clears throat> so now one might think that, okay, this is North America and red pines are known for being very dependent on fire, but does it also play a role for Europe? So there are some studies um, with yeah, making experiments mentioned here below with prescribed fires also in Scots pine, um, pristine Scots pine stands in, in Scotland, the Caledonian pine forest. I don't know the exact extent how much fire is used there. Maybe somebody in the audience knows more about it, but um, maybe this is also something which is more relevant um, in Europe than we have thought so far. So now, a few things about biodiversity in general um, and the, the current trend, just a short reminder. How severe the situation is. This is from the latest IPBES report, report that about one out of eight million plant and animal species are threatened with extinction. Um, and you see here how this is distributed across um, different um, organism groups. This is definitely the sixth mass extinction. The last time so many species died out in such a short time was most probably when an asteroid hit Earth 65 million years ago and the dinosaurs disappeared. And the biggest driver of this um, biodiversity loss is land use change on land. It's direct exploitation in the sea. But on land, it's land use change. It's so far not climate change. So if we have, want to do something about biodiversity loss, we have to address land use um, and habitat destruction. And land use, when we talk about land use, we should not focus on, on Europe only. I think we have to consider our impact on the land use elsewhere on the planet. And this is, um, these are not latest numbers on this issue, but I think it's still a very nice illustrative figure showing how many millions of hectare are used elsewhere to import 
yeah, food basically. So you see, for example, in 2008, um, the European Union used for food imports an area of 16 million euros in South America. 16 million euros is approximately the area of croplands in Germany. And you also see a new arrow here. If you com combine, if you compare 87 and 2008, there's this new arrow to China from South America. So simply reflects that the Chinese earn more money and eat more meat. And of course, this is causing a lot of deforestation fires. Um, and it's not only about food, of course, it's also about um, other imports. Um, I guess most of you know that um, palm oil, for example, is also it's mixed with our diesel gasoline, which of course is absolutely insane, but this is how it is. So this is not a topic of higher EU risk, but I think it's an important one to keep in mind. Now regarding the land use challenge for biodiversity, um, it's clear that land use is a lot about food. Um, so you cannot really think much about how to preserve biodiversity without thinking about food. And here, just with one study, I, I only want to illustrate that the future scenarios for how much land we need to feed the people on the planet um, are actually quite positive. There exist many scenarios where we can feed 10 million people without any more deforestation, maybe even with reforestation or afforestation. And the reason, for example, are so-called yield gaps. This is a study on if you if you produce just 50% of the yields you can produce on an acre around the planet, you could feed another 850 million people without more deforestation. And you see yield gaps are very small, like in, in most of the US and Europe, but they're much larger in parts of Eastern Europe and parts of Africa. So the big challenge will be to close this yield gap in a sustainable way, without massive you know, appliance or fertilizer, pesticides, and so on. But in principle, this is a challenge which might be solvable. Um, to, to, halt, to halt biodiversity loss might actually be much easier than um, halting climate change. Um, we simply have to use our land in a much smarter way. So now back to, to fire. <clears throat> um, I mean, this figure, I think the scale simply illustrates very nicely, even if it's not the latest product, that fire plays a big role in most areas of the planet. Um, if there's enough fuel, exceptions, of course, are the moist tropical rainforest. Um, and yeah, where, where I live here in, in Germany, um, Scandinavia also, but I can come back to Scandinavia. It's very recent that we have so little fires there. But if you look at this, it's very obvious this is a burnt area per year that <clears throat> also you cannot understand biodiversity without fire. And fire has been around for a long time. Um, it has been a very big factor, at least since um, the late Miocene, um, about uh, 10 or even 15 million years ago. And here see, see you, you see the, the opening up of the landscape. This is based on carbon isotopes and fossil, um, fossil teeth or in, in old soil material. And you see here, um, in different cores, like Eastern Mediterranean, one in China, the Great Plains, the shift from C3 vegetation, which is mainly forest vegetation, to open grasslands with um, C4. Um, yeah, with C4 vegetation, which leaves another isotopic signal. And you see that in many areas around the globe, about 50 million years ago or so, the landscape opened up. And since then, we have these highly flam flammable landscapes. But even before this, I mean, even if you go back to the Cretaceous, for example, when T-Rex was still around, um, there's a lot of evidence for fire. So clearly, plants have adapted to this. Um, this is a nice warning call from William Bond um, about, yeah, first of all, that fire is not a bad thing because plants in savannas, for example, they are adapted to it. They're here called underground, underground trees because so much biomass is underground and they can easily re-sprout. And of, there's even a debate that, you know, all this talk about carbon uptake and reforestation, afforestation has become a threat to fire-prone systems which have been around for a long time, which are natural and which harbor a very large biodiversity. 
<clears throat> um, so now coming to some modeling application. Um, now, now we have this new tool, you know, these dynamic global vegetation models, which um, Kirsten already talked about. And we can now much better understand how important the role of fire really is to shape habitats, um, to make biomes. And this is the first attempt to do this with the Sheffield um, DGBM, where you see a simulation here in the top with fire on and then with fire off. And you see very, very big changes. Um, what you see here is, um, oops, that was too early. Um, cannot see my own legend here because something from Zoom is in the way. I hope you can see it. Um, um, but it's, um, yeah, you see C3 and C4 herbaceous vegetation and then angiosperms and gymnosperms. Gymnosperms are basically conifer trees and angiosperms here are the, the other trees. And you see that the model suggests that basically, you know, savannas wouldn't exist without fire, would all be forested. Really a very different planet um, with and without fire. Now, recently there has been an update on where some of you also were involved on the Gitta Laslob lab. And um, this is much less dramatic. Here you see from different fire enabled vegetation models, um, you see the tree cover TC with fire and without fire. And then you see the model satellite product in comparison. And here in the bottom right, you see the difference between fire and no fire. And now if you look at the model, the models, you know, with and without fire, I mean, it looks all green. The difference is actually not that large. Um, it's much less dramatic than in this early study I just mentioned. But it's robust, again, that in savannas, African savannas, fire, fires really play a big role for the tree cover. And by this, you know, for the vegetation structure of the, of the whole biome and, of course, its biodiversity. Now, in savannas, now we have another issue, which is um, an increasing shrub encroachment, which might be good for carbon. Um, but it's, um, it's, it's considered to be bad for biodiversity and also for livestock grazing. And in some areas, you cannot explain this shrub encroachment by changes in, in grazing um, or changes in climate. So there is a hypothesis that this is actually driven by the plant physiological effects of increasing CO2 in the atmosphere. Because what you see here at the bottom right is, um, I hope you see everything actually, because I have this Zoom thing always in the way. Um, but yeah, what you see here, I'm sorry, I have a slight flu. Um, what you see here in the bottom right is um, that the CO2 increase, it favors only trees which, which have C3 photosynthesis, which is limited also by CO2. The C4 gases, which have a constant mechanism to concentrate the CO2 um, in the leaves um, to such high levels that it, uh, the, yeah, the plants become very independent of the CO2 level in the atmosphere, they don't benefit from this, high, from this higher CO2. And if you get more trees and woody vegetation into the system, of course, they outcompete also some of the grass vegetation, and then there's less fuel and less fire, and then you get even more trees and woody vegetation. Um, and one way to actually, yeah, basically fight against this to maintain grazing lands and biodiversity is fire use. Um, it's basically the only way which you can apply on a large scale. So, now back to um, yeah now back again to to Europe and another hypothesis relating the potential love um, yeah or related to the potential love between biodiversity and climate change um, no biodiversity and fire um, there is a hypothesis that so-called pyrodiversity can even beget biodiversity so the idea here is that if you have fires in a landscape and maybe of you know different sizes different return intervals you create a very diverse habitat mosaic of different successional stages and the study here shows these different successional stages in an area in southern france where people you know looked at the vegetation successional stage um, as a function of the last fire on the x-axis and it's very clear that you know fire here determines if you get like a low mucky type vegetation or like an oak woodland. 
So creating fire-driven lens um, habitat mosaic can be also quite beneficial for for biodiversity because you get all these different habitats in a in a small area. However, the evidence in general for this hypothesis that biodiversity begets biodiversity, most of the hard evidence does not come from Europe. Um, but what is also clear in Europe, many of our nature reserves, this is the Lüneburger Heide in northern Germany, many of our nature reserves in Europe, um, because of the long human history, they don't preserve nature at all. You know, these are cultural landscapes. Um, and yeah, if you if you don't you know cut the trees or you put goats on um, on the vegetation or you burn it, um, you get forest in these areas. Um, and it's, this only does not only concern you know like heathlands like the Lüneburger Heide. It also applies to the grasslands. Um, Angelica Fiordian mentioned down here um, wrote a nice paper about these you know ancient forgotten ecosystems. Um, um, where she and others showed that um, open grassland vegetation has been around in, in Eastern Europe for most of the Holocene. Um, and the common thinking that it all, would all be forested and grasslands are only anthropogenic um, is clearly wrong. And these grasslands can have very high um, biodiversity. So now another system, European system where fire plays a role. Um, I already mentioned that there's very little fire with some exceptions. I mean, we had recently big fires in Sweden, but in general, we have little fire in Scandinavia. But we know from the few more natural remnants of vegetation, like Modus National Park here, that they have always been burning, you know, maybe only once in a hundred years. Um, but even in this system where we have a lot of mires where, where it's not waterlogged, you get fires. And these fires in the boreal forest they have big impacts um, and they are sometimes seen a, a, as something good. And I was pretty amazed when I found this book from Finland or I got it as a present. Um, and there's a chapter with a yeah, with an extreme title about sui suicide spruce forests, conservation of death and forest museums. And here it's documented how some old thinking, I don't think Finnish foresters think like this um, still, but here you see one citation <clears throat> the natural process under the fire will return its original quality is a continual regress from one succession to the next. The accumulated thick humus layer of a spruce forest equals to suicide. So basically what is argued here, if you just protect the forest and you, um, you prevent the fire, the forest will die because all the nutrients accumulate in the humus layer in these cold, wet climates, and then the forest is starving. And there is evidence that something like this can happen. This is um, an introduction to one of my yeah, favorite studies about fire, um, where, where people looked at different islands in, in northern Sweden in an archipel archipelago. And the difference between these islands is small islands never burn because the likelihood that you get a, a, a lightning event in a small island is very small. And bigger islands, of course, have a larger likelihood and then the fire can spread. And what has here been docu documented is that de depending on the island size, if the island is bigger, you have more nitrogen um, in the leaves um, here of a dwarf shrub, Empetum, Hermaphroditum, and a, and a moss. Um, you have, if the island is bigger, you have less nitrogen locked up in the humus because there is less humus because it you know, also burns sometimes. And also the tree biomass on the small islands is less than a half in the bigger islands. Soils, climate, everything is exactly the same. So the fire seems to be really important also to, um, yeah, to keep the system productive and make nutrients available. So now a big shift again to the Mediterranean. Um, here it's also very clear that fires have been part of the system for a long time. This is a reconstruction from a number of sites, which you see here on the map. Um, you see the reconstructed fire interval, which has been fairly stable until over the last 8,000 years until recently, and an estimate of the biomass burned. The biomass burned goes down, by the way, because there is less biomass to burn. 
Mediterranean systems have a long history of strong anthropogenic use. And in, at least in Western Mediterranean, you know, the former widespread holm oak, um, Quercus ilex forests, have nearly totally been replaced by uh, vegetation types, which are sometimes seen as degraded or, or more pine dominated um, forests because the pines can cope better, can cope better with um, the fire. Of course, grazing and other land uses also are <clears throat> an important part of this um, transition. Um, yeah, and this is, of course, not, I mean, also, it's not only about climate. Um, humans have used fire here, yeah, since they have been there, you know, already like about 7,000 7, years ago or a bit earlier. Um, so now, again, a jump now about the future um, and scenarios. Um, here, I want to mention a study which is also based on the ECMIP um, models, which Kirsten already mentioned. Um, and here you see the, the increase of extreme events um, for different event types, like river floods, tropical cyclones, drought, heat wave. When you see for heat waves, for example, here, if you increase temperature by three degrees, it's like a 60 time, 62 time, 62 fold increase in heat waves. Um, now here, of course, you want to look at wildfire. And for wildfires, it's much less dramatic, but they're all increase. Yeah, like Kirsten has shown now for other modeling studies. And, you know, each line here is a combination of a climate model with a fire model. There's one, one fire model, which I think is wrong, but for transparency reasons, it was kept in. This is the one, you know, which goes through the roof here. Um, but what you see here is a very, very large spread, indicating large uncertainty. Um, and a lot of this uncertainty is related to yeah, what Kirsten also already mentioned, how, how do humans affect fire, yeah? human ignitions, fire prevention strategies, the biophysical aspect um, of modeling vegetation fire dynamics is actually much, much easier. But um, the human factors are very difficult, and here just see, see in different vegetation fire models, for example, how population density influences number of ignitions or number of fires directly, very simple functions, more or less empirically calibrated. So that's clearly something one needs to improve. And then another thing, um, I keep this also short because it was mentioned, um, is that in the fire MIP, you know, in the first um, simulation round, the models actually did not reproduce the decreasing trend of area burned on a global scale. Um, they rather had maybe an increase, but in the last simulation round, they actually get it. Um, and of course, you know, how can we simulate the future if you are not even reproducing these large scale trends in the past? And the improvements, I think, are mainly due to how, how land use and the human factor is dealt with in the models. So now about biodiversity scenarios and fire. <clears throat> this is a, a study which is very simple, where people simply looked at the, you know, more than 29,000 um, species considered to be um, threatened um, with extinction, um, or at least vulnerable um, in the IUCN database, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, Nature, where experts simply write what is the reason for the threat. There's no modeling in there. It's like all we do with fire models is totally ignored in there, I think. Um, and for 15% of these species, fire seems to be a critical factor. However, what really surprises me, and I don't know if it can be true, the experts, and here the experts are like biodiversity experts and not fire experts. Um, out of these 15%, which is a bit more than a thousand species, only for 55 less fire is, um, is seen as a problem for the species. And for all other species, um, it's assumed that there will be more fires and more extreme fires. And I, I don't think reality is, um, is so, so bad. But I think this is an, an indication that um, in the biodiversity scenarios, we really have to consider the state of the art of the biophysical modeling, for example, with vegetation fire models, much more to make realistic scenarios. And this is just um, 
from the same study, you know, where these species come from, their fire plays a role, and that's surprisingly, savannas and grasslands are important, but um, forests also play a role. So now this is something I just put in there because um, half an hour ago, because people discussed about tree species. Um, and um, this is a very simple statistical model now, simply correlating where species occur today with climate and then applying climate scenarios. And these very simple models su suggest that actually, well, it's a relationship between where trees are today and climate doesn't change. Um, most of Europe or large parts of Europe are covered by this brown thing here. And this is oak two. Oak two is, is different Mediterranean pine, pine trees. No, not, no, oak trees, of course. <laughs> different Mediterranean oaks like Quercus ilex and um, yeah, Quercus uber and, and others. Um, and for foresters, <laughs> this is a pretty threatening scenario because they make most of their money now with different species. So here also the economic losses have been have been assessed. But what I what I want to emphasize with the study is that, of course, to really also explore biodiversity impacts and to really make scenarios for how we can replace the big conifer monocultures of Norway's pools in particular, which are yeah, in Germany basically dying right now, with other species. Um, it yeah, we, we should also really stimulate the main tree species in our models. And in, this, in the study here mentioned on below by myself and others from 2012, we actually do this with LPG, LPG guests, and we will probably apply this tree species based version instead of a plant functional type based version. And we will combine this 2012 version with a version of LPG guests with forest management, which is um, in GMD discussions right now. Now, my conclusions. Um, yeah, first of all, some ecosystems and their biodiversity really depend on fire, you know, savannas, um, but these are rare in Europe. Um, but definitely fire can have beneficial impacts on biodiversity. Um, so creating habitat mosaics, for example, um, or by accelerating nutrient cycling. Um, I mentioned the boreal forest. Um, fire can also promote biodiversity because sometimes we, yeah, we, we actually want to preserve open unnatural cultural landscapes and fire is one way to keep them open which also have been used before um, but clearly you know deforestation fires which are now mainly happening in the tropics or fires of unprecedented extent and severity they yeah, there's no love here <laughs> they destroy habitats and biodiversity and are also most dangerous i think to human society um, so now something which i haven't talked much about but i I think I hinted at it. Um, one good news for me is, you know, if you talk about fire, we also have to think about adaptation to climate change in general. And it's very clear, which is also highlighted in the latest um, IPES, IPES IPCC synthesis report, um, that to deal with climate change and the large spread of uncertainty, um, already in the climate scenarios, we need risk spreading. Yeah, You don't put all eggs in one basket. We need diverse forests, for example, with natural regeneration, we also get a diverse genomic base of biodiversity. And this is not only good for climate change adaptation, it's also great for biodiversity. So it's actually a big win-win situation here. Um, and now when it comes to really the future scenarios that would consider both changes in fire and biodiversity, um, I'm afraid we are not, we are not really there. <laughs> Um, a lot is happening, some promising steps in many projects, but I think there's a lot of work to do in, in fire EU risk. And we really have to link better the work ongoing with yeah, vegetation fire habitat models and scenarios with um, biodiversity scenarios. And hopefully there can be, yeah, <laughs> this can be a lovely relationship between the two. Yeah, I'm done with my talk. So I think now it's, um, it's time for questions and, and comments. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Thank you for your excellent lecture. Um, this is, a, as you said, a very complicated uh, issue, a very complex problem, especially when we put uh, fire in the equation and fire in the, in the, in the problem. 
And uh, that's what we have to do in the, the project in value risk. Let's say try to limit or to reduce that uncertainty that you find there. Uh, you cover the whole, uh, let's say, the whole world. Uh, of course, in the fire risk, we are mostly looking at Europe, but, but we are uh, also considering other parts of the world. We have partners from different countries, different regions, and we want to, uh, really to address the, the whole problem. And uh, that's uh, very good that, that you put this in picture. Um, I don't think we have questions, uh, but I'd like to invite also Kirsten, uh, because there were some mentions to your talk by Thomas, if you want, let's say, to make any a comment or address to the uh, to this uh, uh, presentation of Thomas about the future scenarios of biodiversity and fire and how we can bring these two, uh, these things together, please. Uh, thanks, Domingos, and also thanks, Thomas, for this uh, nice talk. I think Thomas pointed out one aspect uh, that is that is very important, and I think I'm, I'm glad um, that we put these two talks here in in one webinar because he emphasized good arguments why we need in some areas a certain amount of fire to maintain the biodiversity and the forest. So we need to think about um, our vegetation in a in a diverse way. So we uh, we have several. Um, say ecosystem functions, or if we think about uh, them as ecosystem services, and uh, we should regard fire in some areas um, as one function of maintaining um, this um, diversity. And of course, uh, we need to understand the context where we come from, uh, where this ecosystem comes from, and what the current uh, threats and, and uh, risks are. And I think this provides the context um, also if we want to interpret and find solution for adaptation under future conditions. So I think uh, Thomas emphasized very nicely the challenges that lie ahead of us because there will be not one big uh, solution that applies to, to every situation. And to remind ourselves also of the old knowledge um, that uh, that is out there, I think, is is um, is a very important one if we think about uh, some solutions. So um, yeah, so I'm I'm happy, very happy that our talks could actually bring a wide range of of arguments and 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 evidence that is out there. I would also I would just like to add one more argument, um, if I may, which I forgot in in the talk. <laughs> I think in some areas we will have no choice, you know, I mean, if you look at the Cordex climate scenarios and parts of the in particular Western Mediterranean, but it, it looks um, tough. Yeah. So I think um, preventing fires as much as possible might, when well, maybe it's good as much as possible, but it will not be feasible to prevent them. Yeah. To, to, to make, uh, there will be more fires. There's no debates. We, we have to live with some. And even in, in other areas, maybe also parts of Scandinavia or yeah, things will change. So we have to start living with them. Uh, Thomas, your uh, talk was, let's say, essentially about natural vegetation. But uh, in uh, large parts, parts of Europe, we have uh, very much disturbed man-made uh, forest. Uh, how can we consider these uh, effects bit of fire and the uh, biodiversity applied to these uh, very man-made forests because quite often the the interest is economic let's say people plant forests to take some uh, economic interest how can we bring these uh, concepts of biodiversity also into play together with fire in managing the forest no. Well, I actually didn't intend to speak mostly about pristine forests. Um, so, you know, what I said, I mean, okay, I had some beautiful pictures from some nature reserves, but <laughs> I mean, what I said about fire in Scandinavia, in Mudos National Park, um, I mean, this equally applies to, to all the, the planted forests. Um, or also when I showed these different, uh, different successional stages in the a, in a, in a Mediterranean, um, yeah, in the Mediterranean area in so southeastern France, I mean, there are 
they are of course not natural there. Yeah, I mean, Marquis, Garik, um, they're not really natural systems. Um, so I, yeah, I didn't intend to talk about pristine forests only. So for me, no, of course we, U Europe is not natural. Um, at least if you <laughs> consider nature without humans, maybe we should consider us being part of nature, but that's another debate. Um, but I think in the, what I, what I shortly mentioned in the end, um, I think we will apply a model that's not simulating potential natural vegetation. We will apply the, the LPJ guess model with forest management. Um, so we will plant the forest as it is right now. And then look at different scenarios, you know, how we might change that. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, we now have a question from Julie Bauses, who is also um, a researcher from Fire Risk Project, that uh, actually is addressing both of you because he is asking uh, that it would be nice to include biodiversity in Kirsten's model. Would it be possible? It is his question. Julie Bauses. Um, yes. So um, what we also have developed in, in our team, and it's one option um, that we can, uh, that we have in this project, um, we have also a biodiversity version um, of our LPJ ML model, it's called LPJ ML fit. And here we also like the LPJ gas model. Um, simulate individual uh, trees, so how they grow over time and they compete in these uh, forest patches and they also have different uh, functional traits. So uh, through that we could also merge it uh, with the um, Spitfire model and um, yeah, bring in diversity of uh, traits related to fire, which uh, Julie is a great expert on. And, um, and through that if you think of uh, then this is an <coughs> advantage or great advantage of using these different uh, model versions. Think of a model um, that has say bio monocultures, uh, how I described it with the average individual approach and fire. Um, so that would be, uh, yeah, naturally growing forest, but actually it would be only um, say one average uh, tree and fire, then you can have it uh, with uh, the gap dynamics, the, the LPJ guess model, the original version with the fire from Thomas, and then complement it with something uh, considering the management and having uh, also a version with the biodiversity or say plant trait diversity as we call it. In comparison uh, with the different scenarios, one could figure out, okay, what are the limits of forest management? What are the limits of biodiversity? And what are the limits of when you continue um, dealing with, uh, with monocultures one way or the others? And through that already, we hope to, uh, to learn um, how the different adaptations or limits to adaptations could actually occur. Or if we think of um, EU policies, where we try uh, to uh, find, okay, we need to maintain the biomass because we need this as the carbon storage. So that is one initiative. We want to preserve biodiversity, but also keep um, the fire risk low to improve uh, fire prevention. Um, and all these things are quite challenges. So maybe in comparison, uh, we will be able to, to learn something about the opportunities and, and the challenges that arise, uh, yeah, that arise from that. So this is one option um, that, that we have. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to, to move in this direction, Thomas. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sounds very exciting, of course. I mean, I, I know your work and it's great. Um, but there's, an, there's even another way, which is even simpler, you know, <laughs> yeah. which is to bring the DGVMs into the biodiversity models. Because I think in biodiversity models and scenarios and actually even in nature conservation, um, and the many biodiversity models are, for example, species distribution models where you correlate where species occurs with like climatic variables, soil types, land, co land cover types. Um, but with the DGVMs, we actually simulate the habitat <laughs> for these species. 
So I, I think this habitat information, including things like fire return interval or so, this should be used in the biodiversity models. And I, and I think these habitat changes, which we simulate with vegetation models or fire enabled vegetation models, they have a much higher impact than you know temperature degree more or less. I mean, if the, if the forest type is gone, then all the species adapted to this forest type are gone. Um, so I think we, yeah, there's also this other way around, you know, biodiversity in DGVMs or DGVM results into, into biodiversity concepts and, and models. Okay, Thomas. So at the beginning of your lecture, you brought this uh, issue of the land use and uh, you almost pointed, let's say, that the changes in land use, land cover uh, may trigger, uh, let's say, difference in the uh, uh, ecosystems and uh, the life on, on, the, on, the, on the earth. Um, and while uh, Kirsten was pointing more towards the climate changes, uh, let's say, of course, there is a, a feedback between uh, these, uh, these aspects, but uh, for me, it was not very clear how uh, we can address with your models and with your approaches uh, uh, simultaneously these changes in the land use and land cover changes and also the, the climate change and the, including this subject of biodiversity that you brought in your lecture uh, now. Yeah. Maybe just uh, shortly and then you, Kirsten. Mm -hmm. I mean, in principle, land use is part of the models. Um, you know, potential natural, that was like 10, 10 years ago. Um, now, most of the work is looking at how to implement land use. And yeah, for example, also forest management, crop management. I mean, the models are not perfect, of course. <laughs> um, but um, I mean, we, in most studies, we always think about climate and land use change impacts. And you always need like a climate scenario data set. And then, then when it comes to land use change, scenarios of course it becomes more difficult because there's nothing on the shelf like forest management change across europe i mean this has to be developed with stakeholders and yeah but maybe that's enough from my side kirsten yeah i think uh, what has to, uh, to keep in mind if you uh, yeah well we divide our land um, area into um, a grid a matrix um, of different grid cells and from the modelers, um, the land use modelers, we get their scenarios. Um, and that scenario tells us for each year, the proportion mm -hmm. of land use in each of these grid cells. So with increasing land use, we reduce in our model um, the area of natural vegetation. And so the models on this area where there's land use start to simulate uh, crops, manage grasslands, um, different uh, sorts of crops and stuff like that. And so the fires at the moment, the Spitfire model simulate the fire risk um, on those uh, natural vegetation areas. All components, the managed grassland, the crops, the natural vegetation are forced with uh, climate. So with that, we can check the um, influence of land use and climate change um, on the vegetation and on, on fire and the, the fire if risk and, and effects. Um, what is perhaps a bit difficult um, is to look at the effects in this context uh, on land use change um, on biodiversity in this um, natural vegetation. This is a, perhaps something that is um, feasible, but perhaps too much uh, for, this, for this project. But it's certainly um, on the research agenda um, in, in our working groups, as, uh, Thomas, as well as mine, because this is a challenge to understand how biodiversity changes in the future and how it is affected by land use change. Because one thing, um, the global assessment um, of the IPBES has clearly shown that uh, the land use change from the past since the Industrial Revolution or accelerating since 1950 until now has really 
brought huge damage already to the ecosystems. And we are, we as human society, are sending these weakened systems into further land use and climate change conditions. And um, yeah, and to bring in a fire in this discussion is something that uh, we hope to provide and add to this um, um, debate. And then just to mention one more challenge, um, with climate, it's easy, you know, we have climate scenarios, run our models, okay, there are some feedbacks on the climate system, but it's basically one way. With land use, ideally, we get one land use change scenario to adapt to climate change, run our models, and then tell the people, okay, this would be the outcome. <laughs> and then there would be a feedback to new land use change scenarios. But we don't have a lot of time to have many, many loops in the project. Um, so I think we really need to communicate early on some of the impact model results with you know stakeholders or land use change modelers to, to really inform potential land use change scenarios already by the impacts. Um, yeah. So we can say, okay, if you choose this future, all the trees will die, everything will burn. If you choose this, biodiversity will flourish. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think uh, Thomas raises one important point is that, mm -hmm. um, of course, we as managers and policymakers uh, and scientists together, um, if we see one development going in one direction, even if it takes 10 years to, to change things also in the policy arena, of course, we would react as we now uh, look for implications of the uh, fire extremes that uh, we have experienced in the, over the last three years. Of course, we, human society and management, uh, we react to this and hope to uh, be on a different path. So through this dialogue, um, perhaps there's also some setting we can discuss um, to, yeah, to test the outcome of different pathways. Okay. Thomas, now we have a question from the audience, uh, from a person, Riaz Shaikh. Uh, he asks, in your lecture, you explained that some small islands have less chances for fires. Along with nitrogen, uh, something else was mentioned. Could you please elaborate about this? If you want to go back to your presentation, please do. Yeah, maybe that's not necessary. Um, I simply found this study very illustrative for that fire can also be a good thing for the ecosystem. Um, so this was simply a study where people in, in an area where climate and soil types are exactly the same, they looked at islands of different sizes. And I think the first thing they realized is on the small islands, the trees are much smaller. And the litter layer is much larger. Um, because in these very nutrient poor systems in, in Northern Scandinavia, if the trees just grow, more and more litter gets accumulated. Um, and it's not so easily decomposed in these cold climates with a very short growing season. And the accumulating litter, um, the nitrogen, for example, that's in there, is basically gone for the, for the plants. They cannot use it anymore. So as more and more litter accumulates, the growth of the plants go, the, go down, 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 down. This is what some foresters called like this some um, suicide, yeah, spruce suicide, something. I forgot the exact name. Um, now, when a fire comes, then you know some of the humus and of course biomass um, burns. You get a lot of nutrients which are made available, and the forest grow grows much better after that. And and here they could show the effect over long time periods by simply looking at large islands which sometimes burn and small islands, which not burn. Because I mean, the likelihood that a small island is hit by a lightning strike is very small. A big island can be hit by a lightning strike somewhere and then the fire can spread. Um, so yeah, I hope, is it clearer now? Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> Um, the, we have now another question from Paul Reich, and he is asking about water consumption in the land use and in human consumption in general. So uh, this is also a question for both of you if you want to address on water consumption. 
Well, just to cut it short, I think most of us, our water consumption is for irrigation of crops. So it's food. This is much more than what you, you know, use in a house or so on. Um, so it's still anthropogenic, but yeah. And of course we need water for our forests also. Um, but, but what you use in your house is negligible compared to like on, on European or global scale compared to irrigation agriculture. Or Kirsten, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> I'm not a hydrologist, um, so I would I would agree. Um, of course, there's the industrial uh, water consumption um, that can also contribute uh, to it. Um, but I think the the biggest issue is really um, water used for for irrigation um, and also uh, for for hydropower. Um, so think of all the big uh, reser reservoirs um, set up. Um, yeah, but this is not really my, my area um, of, of expertise, um, but what we know is, of course, that in areas that are facing increasing drought conditions, um, all these water conflicts arise because um, we need water for, for multiple uses, and um, of course, this is becoming an issue, and if I think of extreme uh, fire conditions um, where the vegetation is really weakened, um, we have the challenge because you need still enough water to extinguish the fire. And um, if the cloud is really um, yellow, uh, the atmosphere um, is, is really yellow and you have these smoke plumes um, affecting visibilities, then your firefighting equipment cannot really get off uh, in the air and help to uh, distinguish, extinguish the fires. So here we can really be in a, in a very grim situation, but uh, the, the whole issue, of course, uh, starts uh, much, much, much earlier about these uh, water um, yeah, uh, conflicts that uh, may also affect us in the future or already started in, in drought hit areas. And maybe I just like to correct myself a bit because I thought about the water conflicts where I live around Frankfurt. And, you know, a big city like Frankfurt, of course, also uses a lot of water. So here you have a fight between the city and the plains in the south in particular, um, where people want have like vegetable agriculture with irrigation. And then you have the foresters. And because so much water has been used for agriculture, for irrigation and for the city of Frankfurt, the water table on the sandy soils in the forest went from top to five meters down. So all the trees die. <laughs> Um, but the forest is the smallest user here. So it's more the, the irrigation, agriculture and, and the city. And I guess there are similar situations um, in other areas across Europe. Thomas, I was uh, stricken by your fra the phrase that you picked from that Finnish book that the humus accumulation is a suicide. Yeah. Uh, path for the, the that uh, by by system is that uh, a very specific of that uh, case or are there other situations that you can identify where nature is uh, and the uh, uh, climate are driving to this so sort of suicide let's say to the destruction of yeah. the life okay. yeah um well i think this applies to a large part of the boreal forest in europe yeah, um, maybe not the southern boreal forest, but in the north where it's cold and where you, because of the climate, get this huge humus accumulation, I think it's fairly widespread. Um, it is the suicide side thing, of course, is if you are a forester and want biomass, then it's suicide. For biodiversity, it doesn't matter how much biomass you have, as long as you have structural variability and some dead wood and some living trees um so i would say it's a it's a general thing for the boreal forest but it is somehow different with clear-cut forestry which is the main forestry system in in northern europe um it's yeah not like taking individual trees it's yeah, the, the Swedish, where I lived for some time, they can actually be quite barbarian in the forest, I would say. <laughs> um, 
and of course with, with a clear cut system you also you you don't get the same level of humus accumulation it becomes a totally different system again and then of course you have the issue that you always take out biomass um, and nutrients and uh, if you don't give anything back there is a big debate if nutrient imbalances are a big problem there or not um, but there are problems with soil acidification and you know at some level of ph you get aluminium into the water and then the fish die in the lakes and, or the people fishing the fish get unhealthy yeah so i i think it's not a very specific thing um yeah uh, continuing to speak about the northern europe one thing that is very clear for us in the last decade is that uh, things are changing in the north of Europe in terms of, uh, I would say, also uh, uh, vegetation cover and the cycle of vegetation and the uh, uh, presence of fire, because this has been... Uh, and uh, everything says that in the future, this will be uh, even more. I'd like to ask you both if, uh, let's say, your work, your models, uh, predict this uh, change and uh, how, f how far will it go uh, yeah. so that we can take it into account. Yeah. Just a very short comment. I'm not so sure about the far north of Europe because the precipitation projections are, you know, mostly increasing precipitation. So I'm, I'm more concerned about the Mediterranean because there it's so consistent, you know, less precipitation and much warmer temperatures. This is really, really a deadly cocktail. But in the north, I think it's less clear that it will be so much drier. Um, but I haven't looked at this for some time. So maybe maybe I'm wrong, Kirsten. Um, I think we should check um, the latest uh, climate scenarios, actually what they uh, um, show, because there has been uh, quite a change um, also in the uh, Cordex uh, regional climate scenarios um, in comparison also to the to the global scenarios. But uh, the key point that you raised, Thomas, is um, of course in the high north we see the the um, impact of the Arctic acceleration. So that means you have in the far north you have tremendous uh, increases in temperature. But then it depends on the precipitation changes if this leads to not only warmer, but also drier conditions. So this is something uh, where the uncertainty was still high in the climate scenarios, uh, where you probably might have got uh, had a, a very wide range of outcome. But uh, from our previous analysis um, that we uh, that I showed only the uh, general change over time, uh, what we saw uh, for the southern boreal definitely an increase in uh, fire. Uh, do, um, especially under the um, most severe uh, scenario, the RCP 8.5, we saw an increase in in fire um, projected for this for this area due to the increase in in temperatures and with some reduction in, in precipitation. But uh, certainly within our project, we should uh, use the latest uh, climate scenarios and revisit um, these conditions. Um, to really get a, a better overview of, of these changes, because a lot of things are on the move on the science side and, and the scenario side, but also how things are changing in the, in, in the region. So, and also, of course, when we talk about, oh yes, fire will increase high up in the, in the north in Scandinavia, um, I think it will not mean that we, we have the risk of getting Mediterranean conditions there, but relative to what the ecosystems and the people know, um, there's, I, I think that there's a good probability um, that fire will um, be more frequent and uh, affect larger areas. But, but I think the foresters, just to add, the foresters in the north, they're much more afraid of bark beetles and different fungi, which thrive mm -hmm. in warmer climate. Um, I think these are much bigger tree killers right now in, yeah, not in the boreal forest in general, but in the European boreal forest, which burns much less than the Canadian or the, the Russian um, boreal forest. Yeah. Uh, 
I'd like to thank the audience for the questions. And we now have another one from Paul Reich. And he's asking, what's your opinion about replant the forest after the wildfire and, and continue to plant alien species? Yeah. Should I start or you, Kirsten? No, you go. Okay. Um, well, it's clear if we now replace um, our Norway spruce and Scots pine monoculture culture plantations with Douglas fir, which you know is a favorite option for some because it's good money um, and they, they cope better with drought. Um, I think it's clear that the risk will be too high that things go to hell. And there's also evidence that if you, if you plant Douglas fir in larger and larger monocultures, in the beginning, like the pests from Europe, they didn't like it so much, but at some point they figure out, oh, this is also tasty. <laughs> so, um, so, so I think we need more diverse forests and, 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 and we don't know enough and the, the uncertainty is too high to really choose a particular um, non-native tree species. Um, another problem we have with non-native tree species is um, that they often are genetically not so diverse because they are taken from a nursery, you know, few trees, and you have much more genetic diversity in a natural beech forest, for example. Um, but on the other hand, it depends on what you, how you define an alien tree species. I would say in, in my risk spreading mix, why not bring some Mediterranean, you know, oaks to around here? and see how it goes. You, you might consider them alien because I did not, this would be assisted migration. Um, but in my mix, I would also have some, at least some from the South assisted migration. Alien species from other continents, I would be more careful. You know, they might also bring new pests, which are totally new to the whole continent. Um, but, but my personal opinion is, and this is something where also some of my friends go really crazy at me. I would say to have in the mix also some alien ones, if you're really careful with like the pest spreading, why not? I mean, we have them anyway, you know, already. And we had them for a long time, but this is just my, but, uh, but I would say this should be a minor component. I would rather take species from the South, assisted migration. And the main thing should be mixed forests with natural regeneration because this gives you the highest genetic diversity. Thank you, Kirsten. Do you want to comment? Yeah, I think I, I fully agree with uh, what Thomas said is that um, I think one it goes down to the really the key message is trying to spread the risk. Um, so find maybe um, yeah, a way where we can have an acceptable level of, of fire risk and, and pests combined, um, because again, it will depend on the local um, conditions um, that, um, of course, we need multi-species uh, forest replanting, um, have uh, several tree layers or uh, in an area where um, we can somehow manage um, to keep the fire at a very low level so that the fire will not go into um, the lowest layer and then it will be so intense that it will grow into the into the canopy and, and cause a crown fire. So it will depend on on, on on the areas where we are and what is uh, what is the best option. And maybe it, it will be uh, with some assisted uh, forest management um, that we in some areas where we think, oh, uh, there could be a closed forest possible. It would be and we could have good biomass yields. It will might be important to to have them uh, a bit more open to to reduce the fire risk, and then uh, also with these um, goals formulated, find the best mixture um, what is more suitable in this in these local conditions. So I fully support what uh, Thomas said. Is um, we might have we need to spread the risk. Um, have, diversify it and also think of 
a, a diverse range of options, of management options that we have and use those. There's not one silver bullet solution that can apply to every condition. And I think many uh, local experts are very well aware of that. So with the fusion of our new knowledge and their experience, I think we can, we, we can be on a very good way. And, and the whole issue, by the way, summarized in the IPES IPCC synthesis report I mentioned in the chapter on forests and adaptation, very condensed. It's like two or three pages. Um, so one can read more about it there. I have been involved in this report. This is why I know it well. Yeah, and it's it's open access, so people can uh, can easily find it. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, we have already spent two hours of our time and uh, i'd like to ask to thank you again uh, and all of you who attended and especially those who participated raising questions to the speakers and in the on behalf of the project i would like to to thank you all uh, in particular to our speakers kirsten and uh, thomas for your excellent le lectures and we look forward to meet you uh, again in uh, other webinars that we'll organize uh, to dis disseminate the, the scientific uh, the topics and to raise discussion uh, around them. So goodbye.